my block and now the cops are stopping me I said what you doing here like why you trying to talk to me I said officer what am I doing wrong Let me get just what I came for I really won't be long When I told him I had children he was looking at me differently Doing what I'm doing while he gotta clench his fist at me I came about the dirt but they still mad cause of my history I'ma keep on going to the top until they sick of me Said he protest but I don't even see a change Always hearing BLM but is it really in your brain Gotta see what's going on cause we ain't all treated the same Why so serious I'm furious cause this is not no game I want to welcome you back to another episode of NBWA, New Brunswickers Want Action. Once again, I want to introduce my co-host, Mr. Matthew Martin. Matthew, how are you? Good, good. Um, and Mr. Noise. Dr. Timothy Christie. And as you can see, we're all socially distanced. But today, I want to talk about our outcomes, because we've got a special guest who I will introduce in a moment, but I want to talk about what we're here for. As I've said before, the umbrella of our show is a discussion about systemic discrimination, racial discrimination, and getting rid of those things, as we've discussed many times. The outcomes that we want to discuss today are outcomes in, in making, excuse me, outcomes in the criminality of racial discrimination, outcomes in education, that is the inclusion of black history education and otherwise in our, in our systems, and also, we've discussed quite a bit an outcome that we're looking for, which is a public inquiry as um, a whole of government approach in New Brunswick when it comes to systemic discrimination. Now, with all of that in mind and laid out to you, I want to introduce a very special guest today. Today on the show, we've got a gentleman who is a multidisciplinary educator received a Master's of Education from the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton. He focuses on being a research professional with a focus on public policy and equity-based investigations. So, I'll just, I'll just comment, he might have won a Grey Cup with the Montreal <laughs> Alouette, but I don't know. I don't know, I'm not a big football fan, but I've heard that might be something he's done. So, I want to introduce you folks to our, our guest. His name is Balarama Holness, and I want to welcome him to the show. Mr. Holness, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It's absolutely our pleasure. So we want to get into the show today, um, Balarama. And first, can you tell us maybe just a little bit about yourself? And then we've got some areas that we'd like to point the show at so that we can have a, a really open discussion about those areas. Sure. Uh, well, I was born in Montreal. Uh, my father is Jamaican. My mother is French Canadian. Um, around the age of one years old, I moved to the U.S. And I live in an ashram for 10 years. And I come back to Canada, to here in Montreal, and I experience a culture shock um, whereby now my name, my identity is somehow a liability in my life. Um, I go through some trials and tribulations in high school and I discover football. Um, I dedicate myself to the game of football, to track and field, marginally to school. And I, I survived my first bachelor degree. I win a Grey Cup. And then I ended, I ended my, I had an epiphany that education was, was going to be the way that I was going to empower myself. Mm -hmm. So I got a master's of education at UNB, as you noted, um, now a bachelor of common law, civil law at McGill. And I got into politics because that's where the power lies. I ran for mayor of Montreal North in 2017, and now I'm eyeing a mayorship here for the city of Montreal in 2021. Excellent. And my apologies for not making note of that very important fact. But what we're going to like to do now is my colleague, Dr. Christie, has spent a lot of time, uh, as well as us, uh, focusing on uh, the criminalization of racial discrimination in Canada. And yeah. Tim, uh, Dr. Christie, I think you've got some, some questions. Uh, one of the projects that we're working on is Right now, throughout Canada, racial discrimination is handled through racial discrimination is handled through the um, Human Rights Act in most provinces. And the way that the Human Rights Act looks at things is it says, well, if you think you are the victim of racial discrimination, then you should file a complaint with the Human Rights Commission. If the Human Rights Commission thinks that your complaint meets a certain standard, they will try to start a mediation process. Um, with you and the respondent, or with the complainant and the respondent, and from there they'll try to come to some type of resolution. 
one of the frustrations we have is uh, some particular problems with that is one, it puts the onus on the victim. If I'm the victim of a different crime, if someone punched me in the nose, for instance, I could call the police. The police could arrest the person. They would interrogate the person. If they have uh, enough information, they might be able to approach the Crown and press charges on the person, uh, against the person, and then the Crown would pursue that. Under the human rights approach, and uh, I have a lot to say about this, I'm looking forward to your thoughts, but under the human rights approach, what happens is as the victim of racial discrimination, the onus is put on you to prove your case, whereas with other crimes, the state does it. So in New Brunswick, for instance, if you go hunting or fishing illegally, the police can arrest you, they can confiscate your, your vehicle, they can put you in jail, they can give you a fine, and all of those things. But there are no real criminal sanctions for racial discrimination. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about our proposal uh, to <coughs> actually make racial discrimination a crime in the Criminal Code of Canada, the way that other things yeah. would be a crime. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned a few very important things. First, the issue of jurisdiction. So as you mentioned, um, if there is any form of racial discrimination on the part of an individual, you're not going to go to, say, for example, here in Quebec, the Superior Court. You're going to go to uh, the Human Rights Commission. And a human, a human Rights Commission does not have any teeth in that they can only recommend damages, but they can't enforce damages. Um, so Quebec has one of the worst um, avenues to get restitution or to get any form of remedy from a human rights perspective. And throughout Canada, it's, it's the same issue whereby you're not going to go through um, the, the most, I would say, powerful or meaningful um, judicial and jurisdictional avenues. And there was a very famous case uh, called Seneca College, whereby um, the courts recognized that it was not a crime <clears throat> and it was not a tort to ultimately uh, discriminate someone, and I had to go through the Human Rights Commission and tribunals. Mm -hmm. And if I were to bring uh, a point, exactly what you're saying is that equality law has failed Canadians. Just to shift the, the jurisdiction and to have it go into, say, the, the Superior Court and to have uh, stronger legislation to protect the rights of minorities, I think is uh, critical. That, that's awesome. Thank you. And the other side of the equation, though, is not just protecting the minorities, but I think punishing the criminals. If we have a police officer, so in <clears throat> Halifax, for instance, they were able to do, the police were able to do some random spot checks on people uh, at one point, particularly in the downtown area. And they were stopping blacks six times more frequently than Caucasians. Yeah. Uh, We've got examples here of uh, RCMP officers who have just shot and killed some indigenous people uh, for on wellness checks and that type of thing. So one of the frustrations I have with the human rights approach is that even if you prove that discrimination happened, no one goes to jail. No one pays any real criminal sanction for it. So if these police that are stopping uh, blacks six times more frequently than whites, that's acts of racism. We can't have yeah. racist cops. So my proposal would be those, each of those police officers committed a crime, they should be convicted of a crime, and then if you have a criminal conviction in your record, you're not be able to possess these po positions of power in our society. So a police officer, a government official, or that type of thing. So I think the absence of a criminal, real meaningful criminal sanction on people um, also uh, pre precipitates the problem. So I'm wondering, what do you think about not only protecting the rights of the of the victims, but actually punishing in a mean meaningful way the racists? Yeah, and uh, you put your you know the hammer on the nail there. So you would have to ultimately amend the criminal code, mm -hmm. and it could possibly go under the sections of mischief and a police officer who profiles or who brutalizes an individual. That's even more extreme. Would get a criminal record. The issue is twofold. Number one, in volonté politique, you have to have a political willingness in order for this to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Number two, you have to delineate what racial profiling is, and that could be more challenging. Between us, we can say something very, very objective. It's seemingly objective, whereby there is an unconscious or conscious bias, and a police officer is targeting a person of color. Now, that subjectivity has to be delineated and made objective in a way in the criminal code that's going to be a challenge, but that's less of a challenge than the lack of political willingness 
and a pushback on on that on that forefront from police unions and possibly even members of parliament who do yeah. not want to have police officers getting criminal records for racial profiling like i would have to be prime minister for that to happen <laughs> i don't think with a homogenous uh parliament whether it's the senate or the house of commons i, I don't think that's going to be uh in our lifetime yeah and don't get me wrong i'm not saying only for police officers but all all racists that commit acts of racial discrimination it's a crime mm -hmm. and i think it should be treated as a crime uh, yeah. so we could talk about that I'm, I'm really appreciative <clears throat> of your thoughts and we could talk about this all night but i think matthew has yeah. a few questions for you yeah if you, if you uh, want to so get again thank you very much for being with us tonight um so my question for you um where you are where you are an educator as well and education is, is a passion of yours um, i think we can both agree um with all of us here that our, our school curriculums clearly lack uh, black history. Um, and I see that as a couple of issues. Um, one, um, kind of like you mentioned, is because of that, um, our black students don't know their past, which is causing some identity crisis issues with them. They don't know where they've come from. And in media and on television, they only see what they can be, whether that's you know a drug dealer or, 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 or a criminal, um, where you know we're not learning about our, our Obamas or um, you know our black our black leaders of, of, of governments our black lawyers um, so I see that as an issue um, I see it as an issue of a very big part of history being missed not only to the black community but to the white community as well we're not talking about slavery which you know is a, a big stepping stone for a lot of issues that we have today in regards to systemic racism and racial discrimination um, and you know without having that in our school system we're really not helping society move forward. So I just kind of like to have your opinion, not only um, a as an individual of, of your thoughts of it lacking in the school systems, but as someone who is passionate for education of what that would mean and what it might look like and take to bring that into our school systems. Yeah, yeah those, so those are very good points. So I think it's twofold. Uh, first of all, so curriculum development, curriculum design, has to reflect a diverse 21st century Canada and has to reflect not just the plight of African Canadians, but also the contributions of African Canadians. Mm -hmm. It has to reflect, you know, from Hogan's Valley to Africville, it has to reflect the black spaces and places that were thriving in Canada and also showed signs of perseverance of Afro descendants. It has to reflect the really what I would call indigenous uh, Afro-Canadians in the Atlantic region who were here far before immigrants, uh, white immigrants at that came from, from Europe. So mm -hmm. I believe that, ha as you mentioned, having curriculum that's attuned to black Canadian history will certainly empower the identities of young boys and girls who are black or indigenous here in Canada. So that's step one and step two, is you need a curriculum that's attuned to a 21st century economy. Right now in low income schools, young boys and girls who are poor are not learning financial literacy, they're not learning uh, legal skills, they're not learning business skills, they're, they're not even being exposed to possibly going to a med school or to becoming an engineer, science, tech, engineering, math. They're not being exposed to the managerial and actually powerful degrees at a high school level at least inspiring them and that's also causing a huge rift between the rich and the poor black and white and so if you go to a low income school in the atlantic region you are going to see older books uh gymnasiums that are underfunded science laboratories that are underfunded homogenous teachers and young boys and girls not only misrepresented and not reflected in curriculum but also they don't have the, the tools and the academic levers of power at the high school level or at the primary school level that's going to equip them to compete in a very competitive global economy. So Balarama, would you consider this an example of systemic racism? That our education system intentionally doesn't include some of these things because nothing happens by mistake. Yeah, that's, but that, that you know, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's um, omitting the uh, representation and identity of black people in our curriculum, mm -hmm. those are just one facet of a larger system in place, but that system in place is also reinforced by teachers. 
Studies show that teachers reinforce the idea that young boys and girls are inferior, who are black, and, and, and they, they push this upon students. So it's not just the curriculum. Yeah, that, that's part and parcel of a larger picture. Mm -hmm. But the way a teacher treats a student or a teacher gives more detentions to black students or the way that that student interacts with you know, administration at large is also part of the social process that upholds systemic racism. So it's not just this curriculum that's on a sheet of paper, it's also the interconnections and relationships between students, teachers, and staff. I, I've personally seen online when people are, positions or grants that are, are given out to certain um, a certain demographic, um, and you know, right now you see a whole lot of organizations and companies saying, we are looking to diversify, and people are saying, oh, well, isn't that a little racist? And I think that's what people are missing is it's not the point that they're being racist. It's the fact that they're acknowledging. Um, so, for example, our, our school system, the school system would acknowledge it, acknowledge the fact that our school is not representing the students. We need to hire more black teachers, more indigenous teachers, more teachers mm -hmm. from the Syrian community. And from going forward from there, like you said, I think th that's a big way is we can address you know, it's a twofold. It's the curriculum as well as who the, the students are mm -hmm. learning from and, and those Agreed. curriculums that are putting on to them. So, and just a really quick point on that, because it's, it's very important. So there's two really quick things. Number one, it's not that the curriculum is intentionally racist. It's, it's de facto racist. Historically, you know, de facto versus de jure. Mm. De jure would be like, you cannot drink from this water fountain and now there's something going to create a system where you cannot do it. So de facto, the curriculum is not representative of people of color. But I don't believe people are overtly in a room thinking, I am going to exclude people of color. Their racism blinds them and their subjective or inherent implicit bias blinds them. And what that means is, very importantly, having black teachers or black individuals who are designing curriculum is going to enrich the curriculum mm -hmm. um, whereby we need more black teachers but it's not because they're black it's because they're actually going to make the content better they're going to improve outcomes they're going to improve learning and they're going to empower students and that's why people want more inclusion not just because they happen to be of color but because they're going to enrich the educational experience of students you did something amazing in montreal you put together a petition um, for tw with, I think, 20, 22,000 people um, to force the city of Montreal to investigate systemic racism um, and do it through its stakeholders, et cetera. Can you elaborate a little more on that? Because that's one of our outcomes that we're looking for here in New Brunswick through this show is to have a public inquiry, whole of government approach uh, looking into systemic discrimination in New Brunswick. But look, can you tell us a little bit about your story and, and uh, your approach there? Yeah, so I would say the, the, the big takeaway is if we're all talking about representation and we want to improve the outcomes of representation, but there's a step that happens before that that is going to automatically equate to representation. And that step before that is democracy. <laughs> if you have a strong democracy that's truly representative, you are going to have more inclusion on the other side. Yeah, sir. So what I did is there was a democratic clause, a participatory democracy clause in the Montreal Charter that would oblige the city of Montreal to hold a public consultation. So I didn't go in the street and protest. I, I, I didn't ask for more inclusion. I just used democracy and law to open up a public consultation mm -hmm. to reflect the the ambitions, the willingness, the passions, the concerns of Montrealers. And it was a phenomenal success. The organizational structure of the city of Montreal changed. The executive committee changed. The mayor was forced to adopt motions. And now there was a floodgate of changes that happened. And people don't even associate it with the consultation because it got so much bigger mm -hmm. than me and bigger than the process. So what every city needs, regardless of where you are in Canada, is a charter that has clauses that allows people to engage their democracy well, well, well beyond just voting. And that's what we did in Montreal, 7,000 participants, 38 recommendations, 
and things are happening. Excellent. So can you give us a few examples of the things that are happening that you could see broadly applying anywhere in Canada that yeah. you folks are doing in Montreal? So first things first, you have to engage people. You, you have to have this consultation. Um, and why that's important is because now the city of Montreal is liable and pressured to implement recommendations. So on June 15th, the city of Montreal officially recognizes systemic racism and discrimination. That is massive because we live in a province where the premier is denying it. Yeah. And the mayor of Montreal, Valérie Plante, a year before denied it. Then we had a shift in the executive committee whereby now there's a person who's actually on the, the executive committee responsible for the implementation of the recommendations. Her name is Kathy Wong. Right. Then we have another important step, and this is recommendation number two. Um, recommendation number two is that there's going to be a commissioner who's going to be paid six figures a year with a team of people in an office that's equivalent to between half a million to a million dollars in, in budget, and they are going to oversee the recommendations and they have to implement an action plan within the next year. And that action plan touches on employment, on housing, on culture, on public security, on inequalities, on urban planning. So there's a lot of work that's being done, but the structure once again has to change. And the first three recommendations that are put into place shifts that structure. And as they famously say, systemic you know, racism requires systemic change. And right now, that's what's happening. Systems are changing in Montreal. Amazing. And again, that's one of our focuses here on, on the show and, and in New Brunswick is, again, to bring the government together to do a, um, a whole of government approach when it comes to investigating systemic discrimination in New Brunswick. But, uh, again, we didn't have the same levers that you had in the charter. We, haven't, we have some legislation that allows us to do that, but I think... Uh, uh, I, I believe the approach should be similar to yours. Um, now, was it the um, the petition that was the primary mover of that? Uh, just just a quick yes. question on that point. Yeah. So the the law is so it's Article 16H of the Montreal okay. Charter. If you look it up, you'll see a participatory, participatory democracy clause. Excuse me. It's called the right of initiative. Any citizen that gets 15,000 signatures triggers the right of initiative and forces the executive committee through a bylaw to mandate the public consultation. So it's by law. Um, 14,999, it wouldn't have happened. 15,000 signatures, you oblige them through law. And if you don't have that charter, this is what you have to do, is you have to run for office, get people of color in New Brunswick to run for office, and you know they might not win, but they're sending a message. I didn't win exactly. seven years, uh, 2017, but I sent a message publicly. And this year we're gonna have double the amount of minority candidates because some people have to go and take the hit, take the bullet at first so everyone else can, can go and engage <laughs> with democracy. So if you don't have it, you have to run for office, whether it's an independent or otherwise, uh, to ensure that these kinds of policies get implemented. No all white homogenous city hall um, regardless of where you are in Canada, is going to mandate a consultation on society. I agree. Race. So, in, in, where we're from here in Saint, well, where we're from in Saint John, it's um, you know, the mayor and council. Um, again, it's very homogenous. Everybody is white. The uh, government, all of the MLAs and ministers are white. The executive council is white. Basically, everybody who runs our province is white. And we understand that their perspective might be somewhat different than ours. Having said that, I love what you had to say about that. <laughs> I really do. Um, so in St. John, I believe we're trying to do that. We're trying to create some sort of critical mass of candidates that are brown or otherwise, but not <clears throat> brown, indigenous, black, what have you, so that we can send that message. And I had a very similar discussion with one of my colleagues the other day. <clears throat> we were discussing, you know, how, whether or not that person should run and what they should run for. And I said, are you kidding me? We should all run. Who cares if we yeah. win? I care if I win. But the point is, is sending the message to our community that we are engaged in this. And it sends a further message to not only the community at large, but our specific community that it's safe to do this. 
And maybe you should reiterate that you are running. Oh, yes. 2021, St. John Council, please vote for Neil Clements. I am oh, very yes. passionate about this. As I'm not announcing it for the first time, uh, okay. but I am Ballarama running, and I'm trying to get my co-host to join me in changing the, the balance of power in this province. And I'm not looking for power. I'm looking for equality. Therein will lie the power. Yeah. Um, and so two things. Number one, you're the Canadian Obama. <laughs> yeah, right. right, right. Oh, he, we're never going to live that one down. <laughs> You're trying to fluff um, that off on me? Why don't you be Balarama? I'll be the real deal, Neil. And together we'll make a change and we'll invite Obama go. to the wine and cheese. And, and number two, I don't think we should be shy about saying we're taking power. Like, so the fact of the matter is, is that politics is the definition of politics is who gets what. Right, and that's right. That's power. And the question is, you know, like they say with Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. But so you, with that power, you are going to um, advance equality, justice, you know, diversity, inclusion. But when I speak to, you know, when I do my conferences, I speak to young, young people, I tell them straight up, my law degree is giving me power. Exactly. It's empowering me. One thing I will say, Balarama, not to cut you off just because we're running short on time. Sure. On that okay. point, I said to myself when I became a lawyer a million years ago, only from the inside can I change things. But what yeah. I found was you need some black up. True. Right? And when you're alone, it's hard. It's a very difficult battle. But to know that there are people like you and Dr. Christie and, and Mr. Martin and others who we're discovering in the eastern region and further, that provides the black up we need to make change in this particular country. A hundred. If you want me to come knock on some doors for you during your election, just give us a shout. Oh, we're, we're there. You know, did, you know, everybody in Atlanta, Canada, and internationally is going to hear that, or nationally, right? I'm holding Let's you go. to that, Balarama. Likewise, I'd be happy to come back to Montreal. It was one of my most favorite places during university. Dr. Christie, you had some really, really important uh, comments to make. Anything to wrap up the segment today? And I just want to reiterate that there are concrete, tangible things that we're asking for in this show. Mm -hmm. We want racial discrimination to be a crime under the Criminal Code of Canada. And we're not asking modestly. We know that people can do it. It can they, be done. It can be done. We're asking for meaningful education, not just black history, but the entire curriculum to be changed mm -hmm. uh, in the education system. And then also, we need a clear, accountable public inquiry in New Brunswick into systemic racism and discrimination. And we appreciate you coming on to have this discussion with us today. I really do. Thank you. I appreciate it. And all those things, uh, we can achieve them. It's just a matter of coming together and running for office, doing class action lawsuits and pressuring government. Absolutely. Well, we thank you very much. I want to thank you all for joining us once again. And don't forget, if you have comments about the show or you have questions for us or Mr. Holness, you can reach us at nbwa at chco.tv. Make it a great day and choose to win.